Hi, this is Julie Roca with the podcast Aging Gracefully with Julie Roca. Welcome. You know, as we age, sometimes uh, you may have issues with memory. For example, um, I get people concerned all the time. They lose their keys or uh, they, they forget appointments and uh, they start to be concerned about cognitive issues. Um, there's a lot of buzz these days about Alzheimer's, about dementia, and people want to know, is it me? Is this something that I'm facing? And so I thought it would be special today to bring a specialist. I've brought Dr. Jeremy Grant to be uh, joining me today. He's a clinical psychologist, and he's working on some exciting postdoctoral uh, things in the Department of um, Clinical and Health Psychology at the University of Florida. And you have some very exciting uh, research programs that you're doing. So I Welcome, Dr. Grant, to our podcast. Yeah, it's so great to be here. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Yeah. So um, I love your background. You mm -hmm. came from somewhere very interesting. So tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll start at the beginning. I was born in Zimbabwe. Yep. Um, but I'm not Zimbabwean. My parents are Jamaican. Oh, um, okay. So I come from a really multicultural background. My, my parents were both born in Jamaica uh, my dad moved to Canada when he was uh, a young man. My mom moved to England when uh, she was a child. And uh, my mom's family is also uh, multicultural as well. They're, they're Chinese Jamaican. Oh, wow. So lots of different okay. uh, influences <laughs> in my background. They met at university and ended up working as missionaries, essentially, or getting a call to, to work at, uh -huh. a, at a university in Zimbabwe. Okay. And I was born there with my brother. Uh, and then uh, we moved to England. Uh, my dad did a PhD in, in London, England, and I grew up there and then moved to Canada when I was about five. I um, hear so. no English accent. I'm <laughs> yeah. a little bit disappointed. All yeah. this English. I, yeah. <laughs> I, my mom still has, you know, pretty much a, a British accent, you know, or at least the remnants of it. I lost it pretty quickly. It's it's really incredible how yeah. the brain changes when you're young. You can uh, – I, I learned French as a, as a child. They sent me to French school. My parents – didn't know any French and and um and yeah I absorbed that really quickly so within the span of a year of moving to Canada I lost my British accent learned a new language that um, is crazy. really really incredible yeah. that is incredible so um, at some point uh, you got a bachelor's degree in biology from Andrews University mm -hmm. you got a master's degree in neuroscience. Mm -hmm from uh, Carleton University, and then you got your PhD in clinical psychology at Wayne State University. What in the world brought you to Gainesville and <laughs> UF Health? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a long journey to get here. Uh, in clinical psychology, what happens is you do, uh, you have a, there's a match for an internship. It's very similar to medical school where you apply to a bunch of different places, uh, okay. you interview, and then they, they match you somewhere. So I matched uh, here at University of Florida for internship and had the opportunity to stay on for another two years, uh, which I'm completing now uh, as a postdoctoral fellow, so post-PhD, post my doctorate degree, getting more specialized training in clinical neuropsychology. And uh, what brought me here was really the University of Florida is really mm -hmm. one of the, uh, the institutions that really has great expertise uh, yeah. in Alzheimer's disease and aging and, and things like that. Yes, I'm very excited to be here kind of in that hub. Um, so what drew you to studying Alzheimer's, dementia, yeah. those things? Yeah. Well, it, for me, it all really starts with my family, having witnessed it in family members. I've had yeah. three family members with Alzheimer's disease, uh, including two uh, grandparents, um, okay. one on my mom's side, one on my dad's side. And what I found interesting in watching my grandparents is that they had very different courses of Alzheimer's disease, Mike. Wow. On my mom's side, it was my, my grandfather, and he was, uh, you know, most – of the time that I knew him, you know, he'd been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease probably when I was very young. And, you know, he lived for probably 15, 20, almost 20 years with that yeah. diagnosis. Um, and, and it was a very, pretty slow progression. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, until the end of his life. And then uh, on my dad's side, my, my grandmother, uh, my step-grandmother, actually, um, she, she had a more rapid course. Um, it happened a lot more suddenly and, and um, yeah, declined much more, much more quickly. Uh, and so you were there and watching and a part mm -hmm. of, you know, the caregiving process. Right. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Not really part of the caregiving process. Because well, you were young. But yeah, I was young. <laughs> I was, you know, probably, uh, you know, just entering my teens when my step-grandmother um, passed away. 
uh, but but witnessing it and mm-hmm. and I think yeah it's different for you know my dad's side I got to see it kind of start in my grandmother I kind of knew her before it happened and then got to witness it start and then witnessed it wow. just kind of the decline be so rapid and I thought that you know I think early on you know or what I knew before getting into this field was kind of that it just felt like Alzheimer's disease was just kind of like the luck of the, the draw it's just like uh-huh. Yeah. Maybe you're unlucky and you have a rapid decline or maybe you're lucky and it's not so bad. Maybe you're lucky and you don't get it. Wow. But what's really gotten me into this research has maybe uh, has been other experiences that have shown me that it's not just luck. There's lots that we know uh, in science about why some people decline rapidly and why some people don't decline uh, as rapidly. So. Ooh, and I'm so excited to tap into that a little bit. Um, but... You and I get these questions a lot. Um, what's the difference between normal aging, Alzheimer's disease, and dementia? Yeah. Can you touch on that a little bit? Because I think that's a very basic, um, that's very basic information that people are yeah, looking yeah. for. Yeah. Well, the the short answer is Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia. It's a subtype that mm-hmm. there's different kinds of diseases that cause dementia, uh, and Alzheimer's disease just happens to be the, the yeah. most common of them. Um, the, the little bit of the longer answer is that when we think about neurodegenerative disease, that's the term we use for any disease where there's a loss of brain cells, a loss of neurons, yeah. that your neurons yeah. degenerate over time, um, that we kind of think about it in three levels. There's what happens in your brain on a mm-hmm. biological level. Mm-hmm. Then there's what happens in terms of your thinking and memory abilities, those symptoms. Yeah. And then there's function, right? And that's usually what most people care the most about is not about you know what part of the brain is affected or what my test scores are or what my no thing. most people, most people don't are concerned right yeah. they're not concerned <laughs> they're about not most concerned people about are like that. can I still drive mm-hmm. can I still take care of my family can I still work can I still you know take care of my medications yeah. and my finances yeah. can I live independently yeah um, that's really how we think about it in those three stages so mm-hmm. Alzheimer's disease is a term that really refers to kind of the biological as well as kind of the thinking and memory changes that we see. Dementia really refers to function. When someone okay. has experienced a loss in their thinking or memory abilities or a change in their thinking and memory abilities and can no longer take care of themselves independently, we say that person has dementia. It's a clinical okay. diagnosis. Okay. And there are different biological diseases that cause dementia, right? So yeah. Alzheimer's disease happens biologically and results in certain kinds of thinking and memory changes. And a big part of my job is identifying those thinking and memory changes. Yeah. And then uh, those thinking memory changes can be mild or they can be severe enough Mm -hmm. to cause uh, dementia. The other term that we use for dementia is um, major neurocognitive impairment or uh, disorder, major neurocognitive disorder. Yeah. Um, There's another term that's also used, um, uh, mild Mild. neurocognitive disorder or mild cognitive impairment. And that's where a lot of times you'll see people that are still able to live independently. When you get to that more major side, um, that's where, you know, I do placements in assisted living. That's pretty much what I do for my everyday living. Um, And at that point, I'm usually looking for... Um, a memory support community. Right. Um, exactly. So that's, yeah. Bingo. And now you mentioned um, that there are several other kinds of disorders that may cause dementia. Mm-hmm. Um, is it important to find out, you know, what what you might have? Um, once upon a time, people would just say, oh, well, they're, my loved one has dementia. Right. And it didn't matter. But mm-hmm. does it matter now if we know um, definitively if our loved one has um, Alzheimer's, or maybe they have vascular dementia, or maybe they right. have Lewy body. Does that yeah. matter? Yeah, it matters for several reasons. One, um, uh, getting an accurate diagnosis of what the the actual disease is uh, should help inform treatment. We're in yeah. an exciting time yeah. in Alzheimer's disease research right now, yeah. where uh, just over the past like kind of two three years, there's been uh, huge developments in new drugs that can be used to treat. Um, certain kinds of neurodegenerative disease. And specifically, Mm -hmm. the drugs that are coming out are coming out to help deal with one of the proteins that kind of goes awry in Alzheimer's disease. And so knowing specifically, not just, oh, yeah, my parent has dementia, but specifically, do they have Alzheimer's disease or something else could really, you know, particularly in the years to come, really help inform treatment. The other reason why it's important is because some of these disorders 
have more genetic risk than others. Uh, and that's a could be a whole podcast episode, really, right, about yeah. the genetics of some of these disorders. But, you know, when someone just uh, what we call kind of just sporadic Alzheimer's disease, just kind of like, um, you know, there's no there's not a strong genetic reason they mm-hmm, get Alzheimer's mm-hmm. disease probably in their 70s or 80s. Right. Uh, that's a, a little bit less concerning than someone who has Alzheimer's disease a little bit earlier. Right. Oftentimes in those cases, there can be a genetic cause, which means your children might be at heightened risk as well. Mm-hmm. And that's also common in other types of neurological diseases. Uh, yeah. Something to be concerned about. So, so yeah, basically, it's good to know because there may be treatment options. Um, I was listening to one of your colleagues and she said, hey, if you've got vascular dementia, there may be some things that we can do to help. Now. Now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, maybe we can slow down the progression of things. Um and with Alzheimer's and dementia, I'm so excited. Some of the medications that are coming out now are, are you know, like you mentioned, uh, they're going. It's a very exciting time. Um, so, I think it's an important thing um, to figure out, you know, maybe what kind of dementia you have. Yeah. So, how do we do that? What kinds of tests yeah. can be used to diagnose Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, I'd say there's kind of uh, at least really two different ways, but probably two or three ways of, of, of thinking about this. Um, and I kind of think it, I kind of think of it like taking your car to the mechanic, right? Think yeah. of your, as, mm-hmm. your brain yeah. as a car, to, to use that kind of analogy, right? Like you might take your car, you know, you, you notice that something's wrong with your car, you take your car and, and they kind of look under the hood. And then you might also want to take it for a test drive afterwards to see you know, right. you know, or or they might turn on the engine and, and take it for a test drive, or or just see how it's working, see how you know if the lights, uh, you know, the warning lights are still on or something like that. Right. So there's kind of like an offline part to it where they just kind of look under the hood, and mm-hmm. there's also a part where they have to turn on the car and see how it's running, kind yeah. of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of how how I think about it. My job as a clinical neuropsychologist, or, or what, what I'm training to be, um, is really um, taking your car for a test drive, kind of thing. I'm mm-hmm. taking your okay. or taking your brain okay. for a test drive, kind of thing. Okay. Uh, giving people thinking and memory activities or different kinds of tasks to do, oftentimes paper and pencil, sometimes on an iPad, Mm -hmm. and seeing what are your thinking and memory strengths and weaknesses? How is your brain working? Um, And the other side of that is really important to kind of look under the hood and actually have some kind of, get some kind of biological information about your brain. So oftentimes uh, a neuroimaging scan, uh, an MRI of your brain, in some circumstances, a CT scan of your brain, different kinds okay. of imaging, uh, and there's others as well uh, that give us different kinds of information about mm-hmm. what does your brain look like? Are there any parts of the brain that look abnormal? And then we also take it for uh, a test drive, so to speak, and see, okay. all right, is your brain functioning? How is your brain functioning now? That's interesting. So that I had never thought of it that way, but there's definitely two different sides to it for sure. Right. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, if you're going to do a neuropsychological assessment, kind of mm-hmm. what does that look like? Yeah. So typically, um, you know, we bring someone in for maybe uh, 20, 30, maybe 45 minutes of an interview to collect some history. Mm-hmm. And we ask some very specific questions about when uh, did your thinking and memory problems start? What was the first thing that you noticed that was mm-hmm. wrong? Um, And has it gotten worse over time? And do you just talk to the patient that you're working with or do you sometimes interact with family members to get that information? It is ideal to have another person there as well. Yeah. Because if you're asking someone with memory problems about what they remember about their symptoms. That was what I was thinking. Sometimes (laughs) it could be a little bit of a a confound. Right. But it's great to have another family member or someone who knows you well uh, there in the room that we can also speak to and say, what have you noticed about this person's mm-hmm. functioning? Um, and so, yeah, we ask about about thinking and memory changes. We ask about functioning, about changes in driving or taking care of medications or taking care of finances. And then we also get history and, and ideally we also have medical records about other things that could cause memory problems. And it's important to note yeah. if you're listening and you, 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 you think you, you have a family member or yourself, you're experiencing memory problems, there's a whole host of things that could result in memory problems besides just yeah. a neurodegenerative disease. So we try to Even rule those out first. Vitamin deficiencies, yep. right? So vitamin mm-hmm. deficiencies are the human body is so complex and so interesting um, that you know if we're deficient in you know a vitamin B, right? B twelve, B twelve, yeah. mm-hmm. it can cause cognitive issues. Yep. It's pretty exactly. crazy. Yeah. So it's important if you're if you're concerned about cognitive issues, it is really important to go right. talk to your primary care physician. 
Um, and then, so what would they do then to um, to meet with someone like you? Yeah. Um, uh, so probably the, the main referral source for us is typically neurologists. Mm-hmm. Um, so oftentimes it can look like getting a referral from a um, primary care provider, your yeah. family doctor, to a neurologist. And the neurologist would really be the person who um, coordinates getting you a brain scan mm-hmm. and also uh, scheduling with us as well. Yeah. We can also uh, get referrals directly from family care providers. And the key name to look for is a neuropsychologist and ideally a board-certified uh, clinical neuropsychologist. Right, right. Is, is what's okay. Yeah. Um, you are, if people want to get in touch with you and um, tap into your services, how would they do that here yeah. at UF? I'd say there's at least two ways uh, for, for if you're – Someone, if someone is thinking about mm-hmm. a family member or themselves experiencing memory decline and, and they just want to get checked out, um, uh, the main way is, is to go and get a referral uh, to, to our clinic at the Fixel Institute for yes. Neurological Diseases, okay. which is headed by UF Neurology. So okay. if you uh, uh, can say to your family doctor uh, you know, to refer me to UF Neurology uh, for uh, memory concerns or to, to UF, uh, my specific department is clinical and health psychology. Okay. That evaluation would probably be done at the Fixel Institute on, on Archer Road. That's my thought. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We love the Fixel right. Institute here. And um, I, there's another a way that if you're concerned about memory um, uh, problems that, that you can also get another evaluation. Here at the University of Florida, we have something called the One Florida Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Basically, okay. the U.S. government has funded about uh, 33 different centers across the country Wonderful. to kind of study Alzheimer's disease um, kind of collaboratively and, and all together. And the local one here in Florida is, uh, or there's two here in Florida, but ours is the uh, one Florida Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, which is a bunch of institutions in Florida that have gotten together and say, hey, let's study Alzheimer's disease properly together yeah. and, and longitudinally. And so we actually pay people to come in and do like a four to five hour evaluation that involves taking some thinking and memory tests, uh, having some brain scans, wow. okay. uh, and, and we actually reimburse you for your time wow. as well as, as, as a part of uh, being uh, involved in this uh, kind of longitudinal oh, research. Oh, that's cool. But yeah. there's there's two in the state of Florida. So mm-hmm. we have one here at UF. Mm-hmm. Where's the other one? Do you know? So the other sites in our center are located in uh, in mostly in South Florida, okay. University of Miami, Florida Atlantic, and, and some other institutions. And okay. there's also a site in Jacksonville that's a different okay. uh, ADRC. Well, that's pretty cool. We could tap into some of those things. Um, I just want to ask maybe uh, what is one more really important thing that you would like to leave with our listeners today? Yeah. Uh, I'd say the probably the most important thing is that um, or what I end up telling most patients uh, mm-hmm. at the end of my evaluation is that um, there's so much that we know about lifestyle yes. and how it impacts brain yeah. health and how it impacts Alzheimer's disease. Many patients, you know, those we don't diagnose with Alzheimer's disease, those we do, are asking, is there some kind of medication we can take? Yeah. The good news is we're in an exciting time where there's some medications being developed. Yep. But the other truth is we do have some things that we can prescribe yeah. that we have lots of scientific evidence about. And those are things like physical exercise, mm-hmm. um, uh, physical activity, mental activity, social activity, uh, eating well and sleeping well. Those things make a huge difference. They sound simple uh, and sound like things well, you've probably heard your whole life. <laughs> but these things make a huge difference in the rate of decline that we see yeah, in people with yeah. Alzheimer's disease. They sound simple, but just getting trying to get eight hours of sleep a night as an adult when you have a very busy life – it's hard to do that. It's hard to mm-hmm. discipline yourself to do that. It's hard to discipline yourself sometimes to to exercise. Um, you know, it's really easy at the end of the day to reach for well over processed and super sugary foods. Um, so it sounds simple, but um, we probably need to take a whole nother episode just to dive into, you know, what kind of diet are, should we look at? What kind of workouts work best and Mm -hmm. how can we exercise the mind. So I I am so grateful that you were able to come on today. We'll probably have to have another episode. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, we'll be happy to be back. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Grant, for being here. And uh, we will leave information on how you can connect to um, to Dr. Grant here. 
Um, and I just want to remind you, if you have not subscribed yet to our channel, it would really help us if you would like and subscribe. But please remember to share this with uh, your friends and your family. This is meant to be a tool, a helpful tool for everyone. Thank you so much.